Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, joining me for a new episode of Talking Sam. With me today, a, he is a independent pro wrestler around the world. He is known as Chico Adams. He is the current WXW world champion for that promotion. You can see him all over the internet with his amazing promos on Facebook and on YouTube. He's also being seen on USA Network for the WWE and on TNT for AEW. Mr. Adams, Mr. Chico Adams, thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. I'm, I'm honored to have you here, man. <laughs> uh, thank you. It means a lot. How you doing? Absolutely. How you doing today, man? How, how's everything going? Oh, excellent. Uh, I woke up with my health, so I can't complain there. Uh, had a good little training session with uh, TJ Wilson earlier in the ring, so... Yeah, just uh, staying busy, staying healthy, and just uh, climbing that ladder to success. Awesome, man. That's awesome. Uh, that's one of my first questions I want to ask you. Um, what uh, got you into uh, pro wrestling? What was kind of the uh, catalyst that got you into it? My first experience of it was when I was three years old. Um, I watched a VHS tape of The Rock. No, I'm sorry, not The Rock. It was Hulk Hogan versus Macho Man Randy Savage main event. Uh, WrestleMania 5. That's where I my first experience of it. But then I didn't start really watching it until um, October of 1998. And what got me into it was Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, he was so uh, mainstream. Like everywhere you went, you saw t shirts of, you know, Austin 316. And, and people kept talking about him. So I finally decided to sit down and watch, you know, an episode of Raw. And I saw all these colorful characters. I saw The Rock. I saw Gangrel, you know, Triple H, uh, you know, Kane. And, <laughs> and uh, of course, Stone Cold Steve Austin is the one who really uh, caught my attention. And uh, yeah, I just got hooked on it from there. And yeah, got bit by the wrestling bug and decided this is what I wanted to do. Now, when, once you got bit by that wrestling bug, uh, what, what was the process going to uh go to a wrestling school like right out did you go right after high school right after college or what, what was kind of uh, your journey like so yeah i was 10 when i decided this is what i wanted to do and then a couple of years later we got the internet and i just did some research on it and i came across the concept of wrestling school so uh, i did some research i knew that there was uh killer kowalski's wrestling school in massachusetts which is where i'm from mm -hmm. it was only a couple hours away so my dad actually took me when i was 13 to check it out so I got to meet Killer Kowalski I got to Chico are you still there Mr. Adams hello are you still there okay there you are <laughs> sorry about that yeah my phone <laughs> um, so yeah my dad took me when I was 13 to check it out and uh, I got to meet Killer Kowalski. I got to sit in and watch. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I got to watch a training session. Only problem was, we, you know, it's four hours round trip. I, I would have gladly driven, but I was only 13 at the time. So, um, <laughs> you know, I just, my plan at the time was to uh, finish high school and then go to wrestling school. So my next uh, plan was to move to Louisville, Kentucky to join OBW. Um, by the time I graduated high school, though, my parents really wanted me to go to college. So what I did was my spring break of my senior year of high school, I went to Atlanta, Georgia at WWA4, and I did a three-day wrestling camp just, you know, just to see the uh, what it was all about, just to get in the ring and, and get some live training. And I, I loved it. Um, but I decided to go to college first and then pursue wrestling okay. time after college. So I graduated college in May 2011. At that point, WWE was located in Tampa, Florida, so I decided to move to Florida so I can be, you know, close to them. So I moved to Ocala, Florida, and that's where I began training with Dory Funk Jr. I was there for three months, and then I moved to Orlando, Florida, and that's where I've been residing ever since. Now, you mentioned earlier about meeting uh, Killer Kowalski. Killer Kowalski, sorry about that, uh, at the age of 13. Do you... Uh... You did did you did the research on him beforehand before meeting him and did you kind of like understand how kind of like meeting him was like kind of wrestling royalty in a way? 
Yeah, I mean, I, uh, Keller Kowalski is a legend, and I would always you yeah. know, hear about, you know, Triple H in China and um, Matt Bloom, you know, also known as, you know, Prince Albert or Tensai, yeah. uh, Perry Sad. A train. A lot of guys would uh, would always speak highly of him, and I thought, you know, you look at their their uh, work in the ring, and it's, it's no secret that Keller Kowalski instills hard work and, you know, dedication. So uh, when I met him, it was definitely an honor and uh yeah it's wrestling royalty for sure i mean i was you know a little starstruck at the time because i'm only 13 um and also seeing a, a live ring up close um but yeah i definitely knew this man is a legend and i was very honored to meet him um you know sadly he you know passed away uh some years back yeah. um so i never got to actually train with him but i did actually fly home a few months ago to visit family and i actually went to the new england uh, pro wrestling academy they weren't uh, having training that night but i got to you know go and uh, unfortunately they weren't offering training that night which i didn't realize so i was hoping to get a little training session in that night but um yeah one day i'd love to i'd love to you know have a nice training session there and come full circle <laughs> as 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 is life man it always comes for a full circle exactly um when you when you first met dory funk to start training what what was that like um was it a little bit intimidating by just because of the last name Funk, or how how did he come off uh, when that when you first do that first training class? It's funny. Uh, I actually flew down in March 2011, so it was probably roughly 10 years ago, almost to the day, if not already. Um, oh, wow. yeah, I was just so excited because I knew I was about to graduate college, and I knew that I was finally going to pursue this head on. So um, by that point, of course, I was a little bit more mature in life. So I wasn't as, quote, star, a starstruck, but I was the same thing. I was honored to meet him. I appreciated everything that he has done and still does for the wrestling business. And so uh, I was just more excited than anything because I knew like that I was finally almost there to uh, compete, you know, and, and train full time. You, you said you trained with him for, for about three months. Who did you go right out uh, training with after him? Oh, there was a school in Orlando, and, uh, you know, that's where I, I learned a lot. I met a lot of great people. Um, I was able to train with uh, Jesus Rodriguez, and uh, formerly known as Ricardo Rodriguez from the WWE. And uh, I, I give him a lot of credit. He's the one who really, you know, uh, just taught me a lot of what I know. And, uh, you know, Larry Zabisco was another one that I learned from. Scott Hall would come in from time to time. Um, and then, you know, I was there for, for about, I want to say about five, about five-ish years in terms of training. And then I switched over to the Wild Samoan Training Center with Afa the Wild Samoan. And that's when my uh, wrestling career really took off. That's where uh, a lot of more doors were open for me. And this my life and my career took, a, you know, just really took off and really uh, increased from there. Uh, that that is awesome, man. Um, how how would you feel about how do you say each coach, each coaching is? Uh, what what would you say is probably the same teaching they have taught you, but a little bit different in each in their own way? Um, that's the thing about you know I always recommend and encourage people to train from as many different people as you can. Like I've done probably at least 20 seminars over the years and I've trained at a bunch of different schools, learned from different people. I love uh, just trying to take a little bit from each person to making it my own because that's the thing. Everyone teaches you their own thing and, and there's wrestling's mm -hmm. an opinion in that, you know, right. you can learn 10 different things from 10 different people and each one might be right in their own way and it's about finding that balance, finding what works for you and making it your own. Um, the biggest thing I would say is uh, just the basics. You know, so many guys try to, you know, sometimes do things that they they shouldn't be doing, but the basics will always be there. You know, the footwork, the intensity, the facial expressions, the being vocal, the noise. Um, those are all, those will never change. I mean, those will always be there. Those are the building blocks. You know, and just uh, safety and and basics are the main thing that across the board that you know will always be there that they will teach. That's uh, that's awesome, man. Um, we know they teach you pretty much the basics with the holds and everything. What what's the next? Obviously, the next step is probably the promos. What is it about a promo, in your opinion, pretty much sets apart from someone who is obviously 
been training like you have for more than five years to someone who's obviously needs more than maybe a few more classes well here's the the thing about a few classes like training never ends like there's no such thing as okay i'm done with training i'm I'm done i'm gonna move on i'm gonna just do shows training out no matter what if i'm doing shows if i'm wrestling i'm always gonna be training uh for you know 10 years now i've been training consistently i train now three days a week sometimes five six hours a night and i always uh i always preach that i always preach hard work and training and uh, sadly there's a lot of people out there that do shows that don't train at all because in their mind it's well you know i'm already done training I, i do shows i don't have to train there's no such thing as you know being too good to, to train you know um but in terms of promos i i was doing promos i was practicing promos ever since i was a kid and like a lot of us have you know <laughs> in front of the mirror and uh i bought a video camera when i was 12 i saved up for it my parents you know helped me out a little bit and my video camera was my favorite toy i've ever owned i mean i was always doing you know short movies or practicing my promos and you know that's where i really learned to be comfortable and confident in front of the camera so um people always ask me where that came from and it's just honestly this experience just uh, countless hours of just practicing and whether it's in front of the mirror or in front of the camera um but promos are extremely important i mean that's you look at the rock Chris jericho stone cold steve austin hulk Hogan. i mean promos can really separate someone from being you know good to great or from being a star to a superstar i mean it's probably one of my favorite aspects of it because you know i love uh, i love being in front of the camera and i love being over the top and uh you know being able <laughs> to manipulate people's emotions through my own emotions yeah, I'm, and I've really been watching your uh, your Facebook videos, and you uh, on the promos, you really take control. You take a man. You are you just not that you don't believe, but you're like you're a hundred percent behind everything what you say. What would you say? What was uh? What would you say was the promo back when you were wa- back when you were watching uh when you were first watching res- pro wrestling was the one that hooked you during those attitude era with uh, Austin and The Rock? Was it one of their promos or maybe someone else in the WWF or maybe in WCW? That's a great question. Um, one of my favorite promos was when Chris Jericho made his uh, debut in August. Was it August? Yeah, summer of 1999. Yeah. He, debuted, 99, he yeah. debuted and he went back and forth with The Rock. And I remember at the time, I actually didn't watch WCW. Like I might like flip back and forth once in a while, but I never sat there mm-hmm. and watched it. So I actually didn't know who Chris Jericho was at the time. So when he debuted, I'm like, who is this guy? Like, I didn't, I didn't know who he was, you know? Um, so I remember him and, and The Rock going back and forth, but I got hooked on Jericho because I thought, oh my God, this guy is going toe to toe with The Rock. Not many people can say they can hang with The Rock, but you know, that was right. a great way to be introduced. And then from there I started researching him and that's when I realized that, okay, he wrestled at WCW, ECW, Mexico, Japan, around the world. and. To this day, Chris Jericho is a huge inspiration of mine, not just in the ring, but on the microphone and outside of wrestling as well. Um, so that was probably my favorite promo if I had to go back. Another one that stands out um, was Hulk Hogan when he joined the NWO in 1996. I didn't see it live. I watched it, you know, a couple of years later. But that was another one because Hulk Hogan being, quote, the bad guy was something that no one ever expected to see and to see all the fans throwing trash in the ring i mean these are people that grew up that you know listened to him saying you know say your prayers take your vitamins drink your milk someone that you'd think would always be a good guy you know turning against them and so that that was another one just to see how people were emotionally affected by that to the point where they're throwing stuff in the ring um and then i'm trying to think of another good one too yeah just obviously the rock is is the GOAT when it comes to promos being on the microphone. I mean, all his promos were gold. You know, I can't really think of, <laughs> I can't think of a bad one. He really doesn't have a bad one, does no, he? <laughs> I can't even think of one, to be honest. But um, I loved the video package that they did for Rock and Austin at WrestleMania 17 when they did uh, oh, yeah. Like Biscuits My Way. Just that video package and the emotion. I remember they did one, uh, the promo they did where they were um, in a locker room with Jim, uh, Jim Ross and he was 
was, you know, in the middle and Austin and Rock were to the side of him. You could just feel the tension in that in that promo. I mean, you can see it just felt mm-hmm. it was so real, so raw and so emotional that that right there, I mean, that just sold the whole pay-per-view for me, you know. And then of course the match just they killed it. Absolutely. From top to bottom, that was my favorite, not just my favorite WrestleMania, my favorite pay-per-view, my favorite show of all time. Um, so yeah. Yeah, to this day, that's still probably one of the better promo promo packages to promote anything pro wrestling in a long time. Still, exactly. we still, I mean, we still have some good ones in nowadays, but I mean, nothing's comparing to WrestleMania 17, Rock and Austin. Exactly. Now, I wanted to. Uh, I was wondering, how did you get in? get involved with wwe because i've <laughs> as a pro wrestling fan myself i've now noticed little things like oh wait i've seen this guy before i switched the channel to uh tnt watching aew i seen that guy before on another channel how uh, how do you um how do you get involved uh with wwe and with aew as well a lot of it just comes from you know, experience, uh, just, you know, making connections, networking, most importantly, just being respectful and professional to everyone always, wherever you go, because uh, reputation is everything in wrestling. And so if you have the reputation of being professional, hardworking, dependable, you'll go very far in the wrestling business. Uh, You can't teach, you know, dependability. Either you have that or you don't. So um, a big component of WWE was, uh, is, was and is off of the wild Samoan. My, my trainer, my coach, my mentor. Um, you know, he helps get his his kids, his students, opportunities based off of who works the hardest, who is the most dependable, who is you know who puts who puts the effort in. And so uh, it took me probably about seven years before I even did anything with WWE, which I'm not complaining because there's people out there that have been wrestling even longer than that but haven't done it. So I'm very fortunate. But uh, yeah, it took about seven years. But uh, when I finally got my first opportunity with them, I felt like I had truly earned it and I felt ready. I felt prepared. Had I received an opportunity sooner, you know, I still I would have worked hard like I always do. But I felt like I had truly earned it and that I was uh, ready to take on whatever came my way. So very fortunate, very just uh, honored in every sense of the word to represent off of the wild Samoan and to help out any way I can with WWE. That's that's the Mecca. That's my ultimate dream is to uh, one day be signed with them and work full time. Yeah, that's 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 everyone's a uh, t- childhood dream right there, man. Um, you you mentioned right there working with off of one of the wild Samoans, one of the one half of the wild Samoans legendary tag teams. Um, well, how does the relationship been like with him uh, just blossoming through when you first met him to now? I remember I met him in December of 2016 um, and I went to a show to help out, to set up. And I remember like I didn't wrestle that night because, you know, I was there to, to meet everybody and, and help set up the ring and pay dues. And I remember watch it's mm-hmm. funny, like for me to sit and watch a show, like I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the business itself, but like watching people do what I love it just makes me want to get in there and I remember sitting there watching the show and I said one day I'm going to be the number one guy in this company I'm going to be the top guy I'm going to be the top dog the champion the the face of this company uh, I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can and I'm going to prove myself so I, I literally started from the very bottom and had to work my way to the top I started training with Off of the Wild Samoan I started you know my, I made it a point to be the first one there, the last one to leave, set up the ring, take down the ring, um, do the best and the most promos, just be a lead, the leadership by example. And so uh, about three years, literally December of 2016 to December of 2019, um, December of 2019, I became the WXW champion and I've been the champion ever since. I'm, I've been holding it for nearly a year and a half. So, uh, but again, all of that came through Good old fashioned hard work, dedication, loyalty, um, just be, uh, being a leader, the leadership by example, you know, just that's the thing. When you're when you're the top guy, I look at it like this. I'm the back. I need to be the backbone. I am the backbone. I need to lead by example. I need to be the first one there, the last one to leave the, the workforce, the one that sets the bar high and puts everyone else in a position to try to follow that. 
man. And that, hey, man, that obviously that obviously shows because we've seen you not only work as a pro wrestler, but you um, numerous appearances on WWE on NXT and. And I was just, I was also wondering, what was you mentioned right there being, being the workhorse, being the first one in, first one out. What is some of the, um, I don't want to say burdens, but what are some of the challenges of being kind of that locker room leader? Like you know, you have to be uh, kind of on guys. Are you, are you kind of like on guys to make sure, hey, you got to make sure you do this. I'm, I'm no, I'm on this, but you guys have to be on this as well. Well, that's the thing. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm the locker room leader of WXW because there's definitely, there's definitely uh, multiple locker room leaders. There's multiple agents that kind of take on that role. Um, I've always, like I said, I've always believed in leadership by example though. So I'm not the kind of person that will necessarily go up to people and say, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that. What I do is I do my own thing and I say, okay, guys, like, if you want to ask questions, if you want to, you know, learn from me, I'd be more I'd be more than happy to help out. I have someone uh, I'll mention, his name is Corey Bryant. He is based out of, I believe, North Carolina, but he sends me matches, you know, almost on a weekly basis. And he's super respectful, he's super nice. He says, hey, can I get your critique? Can you please watch this and let me know what you think. So I'll, I'll watch the match. I'll give him a full detailed critique of what I think of his match. And so I, I love helping people out. I love the fact that people will take the initiative to ask questions or, you know, seek guidance. But at the same time, I'm also not going to chase after people and offer guidance or advice. I kind of leave that up to people to, you know, not that, not that I'm not anyone special to be giving advice, but if it's there if you need it. So I won't go up to people and hound them or say, you need to do this, you need to do that. Uh, I just lead by example and do my own thing. And, and if someone, I'm always here to, to answer questions or help out in any way. And uh, to go back to, you know, after the Wild Samoan, he's really big on, you know, family and hard work and dedication. So we all definitely learn off each other. And uh, yeah. Absolutely, man. That's that's awesome. Um, I wanted to uh, also get back to you with um, with uh, with the wrestling business today. Last year, with the everything going on with COVID, we saw pretty much the wrestling business on pause for almost every company with with a case of a few. How did how did COVID affect you with WXW and everything around it at first? Well, we WXW didn't run for a few months, and then we did reopen. We did one show, and I believe we stopped running again briefly for like I think another few months before we finally, you know, reopened consistently. Um, in terms of the wrestling business, you know, obviously we didn't do any um, indie shows for a few months, but I did uh, WWE opportunities as well as the one match on AEW. So. From a professional standpoint, um, even though the pandemic, you know, it's an unfortunate situation, professionally, it opened up more doors for me in terms of WWE, in terms of AEW. Um, on an indie level, though, we obviously couldn't run. But what I did was I used that time off from indie shows to, obviously, the gyms are closed, but I would go to a local park and I would do, you know, like running, body weight exercises just to stay, stay in shape there. Also, you know, promos, studying matches, you know, taking notes, you know, things like that. So even though we weren't running um, as much indie shows, I would still do what I could to learn and still grow in the wrestling business. All right. All right. All right. That's good to hear, man. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you guys are still you and uh, others are still trying to do the best you can during those hard, hard, hard difficult times. Um. You mentioned uh, you mentioned AEW. This was kind of a big week for you because almost to the week uh, last year, you faced Jake Hager live on TNT on AEW. Um, what was that like at first? Uh, not only wrestling on TNT, but wrestling in front of basically an empty arena. Was that kind of jarring at first? Was that kind of like, huh, this is kind of awkward? Or what, what was kind of your first initial take at it well, i was just honored for the opportunity to wrestle at all for AEW because the thing is you know they were, were traveling around but of course because of the pandemic they uh they put that on hold so 
I I always obviously AEW started a couple of years ago. Um, AEW was definitely a goal of mine, but I didn't see it happening. You know when it did, so I was just unfortunate circumstances with the pandemic. But I was very honored for that opportunity um, to be in the ring. Though with Hager was just it was incredible because he was someone that. When I was in college, I watched him on TV when he was, you know, Jack Swagger, and I was always a huge fan of his work. And I showed up that night not knowing, you know, who I'd be in the ring with. So when I found out I was wrestling him, you know, I was just, I was just happy to be in the ring in general. But to be in there with someone that, um, who I've studied, who I've admired, was was incredible. In terms of wrestling in front of no fans, a lot of indie guys will joke that oh i'm used to wrestling in front of no fans but the, the, the reality, the reality <laughs> is and i've wrestled in front of crowds of all different sizes my i won my first championship in front of less than 10 people so i mean yeah i wrestled in front of little to no people before so that that part itself wasn't you know but at the same time it adds that different element to it because you're wrestling on national tv and for one of the biggest companies in the world so it definitely added that that extra layer to it um but no i was just very happy with the experience and you know i'd, I'd love to be back if, if that's in the cards yeah i'm, I'm obviously I, I think it'd be awesome to see you back there i mean they're obviously doing more with more indie talent they're doing they just opened a new show with aw dark elevation so i i definitely can see you more as a future player we see more indie guys showing up um i was also i wanted to ask you when you first started with wxw what was kind of the um i want i i was wondering when, when you first start actually when we were first starting the wrestling business what was kind of like the one thing you kind of have to learn that kind of shocked you at first but that you kind of later in time kind of like okay now this starting to make sense Kind of, kind of like the business side, more of the business side, less of the um, technical well, side. Well, the business has evolved a lot. And it's not, uh, there's certain time-honored traditions that aren't as strict as they once were. But one thing was, and I was taught this when I when I went to the wrestling camp in Atlanta when I was a senior in high school, the uh, owner said to me, you know, shaking hands is very important because, you know, we're all in the business together. We're all working with each other for the fans. So, a time-honored tradition is to shake everyone's hand when you enter, you know, a room or, or a locker room, etc. Um, but I remember when I actually got into the business four years later to pursue it full time, um, I went to a show and I remember being in the locker room. And at the time, it was very intimidating for me because I'm literally the new kid on the block and I'm in there in the locker room with guys who've been wrestling over 10 years. And, you know, the wrestlers are talking to each other and going over things. And I remember, like, there were times where perhaps I didn't go up to a certain group of guys because they're they're in the middle of talking about things and it's like oh I don't want to interrupt them I don't want to you know so like walking on eggshells basically and then later on I would get in trouble for not shaking their hands or going up to them you know and sometimes people looked at me and thought I was being you know uh, standoffish or or cocky or being too good to shake their hand when in reality it was the exact opposite I had nothing but respect but I was again, walking on eggshells and didn't want to say or do the wrong thing. So I quickly learned the importance of, you know, shaking everybody's hand. And that's something that's not as strict as it once was, but it's something that I still, to this day, if I'm in a locker room, if I'm, you know, I always make it a point to shake everyone's hand or at least shake their hand, you know, at some point, just to, to maintain that level of, you know, camaraderie and professionalism. So but the biggest thing is respect, you know, be respectful to everyone always, no matter what. You never know who's who and you never know what kind of impact someone can have on you. You might meet someone and you might think, hey, I'll never see that guy again. Or, oh, that guy's a nobody. Well, guess what? Five, ten years later, that guy could be the one who could make or break your chances of getting a job somewhere or that person could be the one that could vouch for you and help you get to that next level or they could be the one to put a word in in which you don't get that opportunity so you know in general it's always great to be respectful to everyone you don't have to get along great with everybody you don't have to be best friends with everybody but always be professional and respectful no matter what because it's not about us it's about the fans we're in this business together to work hard and give them a product and a night they can enjoy Yeah, definitely, man. Uh, I was wondering, what was some of the 
what are some of the best matches you have personally, and not just in WXW, but in 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 the in in indie wrestling so far, in whether wrestling in WXW or anywhere else? Like, what are some of the matches that you personally are proud of having that you go back watching? Like, yeah, you know what, I killed it. I love that match. Or you 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 pull up your phone, take a. You pull up your phone. You want to show someone, hey, you want to know how to do it? Watch my match. Take a look. Here, well, you here it is. WXW a lot, and that is definitely you know a, a big uh, company and a big part of, of my career. But I've actually had uh, probably about 500 live matches throughout the U.S. Uh, throughout. So far, I've competed in 14 states. I've been very fortunate to wrestle for um, you know NXT, Raw, AEW, MLW, Evolve, OVW, FIP. So I've had a lot of matches throughout many different states for many great companies. Um, the top matches I've had, one of my favorite ones would be the match I had against Gangrel in AR, in AR oh, Comic Revolutionary Wrestling. Although at the time, the company was called AWE. But um, it was WrestleMania week in 2017. It was the first encounter that we've had. I've had many matches with him since, but that was our first one. And uh, it was amazing because when I first started watching wrestling full on, he was one of the characters that really captivated me when I was 10 years old. You know, being a being in the fourth grade and seeing this vampire wrestler come out to the ring with flames spitting blood. You know, I was so captivated by him. So to uh, years later, be in the ring with him and go toe to toe with the man who played a part in why I fell in love with it was just incredible. So that's one of one of my most memorable matches um also my first wwe match was against leo rush and uh the match was a dark match so it was never aired on tv and unfortunately i've never had the chance to see uh, a live you know copy of the match but that was uh one, probably one of my best matches as well um also the match with hager i know it was it was a short match but i was just honored for that opportunity to compete on on national tv and the fans the fans Around the world, I had family, friends that were able to watch it. So that was amazing as well. Um, trying to think of other good ones. I've had quite a few. It's, it's hard for me to, you know, narrow it down to just one. Uh, one that I've had probably in recent times that I really loved was the match with EC3. Just because, you know, it was one of his first indie matches um, after being let go from WWE. And so when I found out that I would wrestle him, I went out and I did this really, in my opinion, it was a great promo where I was on the railroad tracks and I really played off the fact that, you know, he preaches controlling your narrative and I was preaching fate and the dynamic there. So uh, I was able to have a solid match with him and, and it was just amazing. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, you mentioned Gangrel. Sorry Hello? about that. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, you're good, man. I'm still working on new kings. I got a new, um, I literally just got a new uh, laptop and microphones. Like, oh man, dad, I just screwed up again. <laughs> no, no, I, I had a call come through and it, it clicked it off, so that was my bad. Uh, no, you're good, man. Don't worry about it. You're good. Hey, if you need to take a call, let me know. We'll stop. And no, no it's, it's fine. Um, were you are you able to fix? That? Like, are you able to? Uh, it won't cause any issues, right? Oh no, no, you, you know, we go. I'll, I'll um, go back. Uh, I'll go back to this and edit everything out and everything. Okay, awesome. Well, yeah. I'm good. I'm good for as long as you need, so I, I'm no interruption. Oh uh, yeah, no problem. So um, anyway, so you you mentioned uh, wrestling Gangrel, and being the wrestling fan that you are, obviously the way we uh, we've been talking. Um, how, how does it uh, how does it feel like wrestling guys like Gangrel and uh, and anyone else growing up uh, growing up watching back in those days? Did you uh, go back in the back and talk to them? Hey, man, you know I was big always been mark marking out for you during your matches while on tv and stuff like that do you ever talk to them like that before after the matches anything I, like, uh, anything like that <laughs> i've i've never once said to a wrestler that i marked out for them or anything like that only because you know even though we grow up watching them even though we idolize them, learn from them, etc. You also have to maintain that level of professionalism. So a lot right. of guys like Gangrel, guys like that, they know that we watch them. They know that we were probably enamored by them. So what I did was I did a promo for the match with Gangrel, and I mentioned the fact that I grew up being captivated by him, etc. So I, I insinuated that in the form of a promo, but I used that to promote the match. So I've never gone up to a wrestler and said that, um, per se, but I, you know, 
just because they they're they're aware of that. They know that we're we're still fans at heart. But I also want to maintain that level of professionalism because we're all in the business together, and that's what it is. It's a business. We're all you know, it's professional. All right, absolutely. And um, I was just wondering, do you ever have one of those like 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 a mark out moments? Like obviously not in front of not in front of those guys or anything like like that but like once they go away or something like that just like to yourself like oh my god i just talked to so and so had a conversation with so and so you just like mark out what's in yourself or anything like that uh honestly no only because only because again i look at the business like yes we're all fans at heart but it's like Mm -hmm. there comes a time where you got to say okay am i a fan or am i in the wrestling business you know do i okay. do i belong behind the guardrails or do i belong in the ring so i i respect a lot of people i respect you know anyone and everyone who gets in the ring and works hard and, and helps pave the way but in terms of a mark out moment i don't you know i don't like to to think of it like that because to me it's like i'm just respectful to everyone i'm respectful i admire what they've done but i won't say i mark out <laughs> i'll just but i will say hey i appreciate your work i appreciate what you've done i appreciate you taking the time to to instill your knowledge or give back but no i, I don't <laughs> to go off of what you said no. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was just curious man <laughs> no, no, it's, it's okay. um um, you you mentioned earlier you wrestled in about fourteen different states. Is there a state you've uh, you haven't wrestled in that you figure you, or you want to like? Hey, you know, I want to jump in there, jump in that market. Once we start opening up more states here in the U.S. Yes, every uh, you meant, I mentioned wrestled in fourteen states, but I love to wrestle in any state that I haven't wrestled in yet. I, I include it and in, including the ones I've also wrestled in. So I just want to <laughs> wrestle anywhere and everywhere that I can that allows me to grow and prosper and climb that ladder to success, you know, one more rung at a time. So, but if I had to say anyone in particular, I really want to love, I would love to wrestle in Texas um, as well as California. Those are probably the two mm-hmm. that are really big on my bucket list. But I also would love to wrestle overseas as well. I mean, I got my passport a couple of years ago, and so I'd love to wrestle in Japan, England, Italy, Mexico. I mean, again, I just want to learn and grow and continue to get better. I mean, you literally just answered my next question. If you could, if you could, what country you would you would want to wrestle? And you just you just answered that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I- and- I, want, I would love to get as much international experience as I could as well, just to learn different, you know, different cultures, different, you know, obviously the wrestling business is, uh, depending on where you go, in some areas, it's a little bit, like for example, in England, they seem to appreciate more of the, um, the entertainment, the showmanship style, whereas, yeah. you know, of course in Japan, they, they seem to appreciate more of the sports aspect of it, the hard, you know, the hard hitting style, so to speak, the as people sometimes like to say but no they appreciate more the athleticism the the uh the sports element of it so again every place you go is different um and i would love to learn different styles and just you know be able to uh, adapt and grow and you know expand my horizon so to speak did you um did you ever watch uh outside uh the u.s promotions when you were first watching wwf at the time did you ever watch like a U japan show back well, in those days or was that ever uh, an option back then well we didn't have the internet until a couple of years later um when i was in like the sixth grade but we had like the slow dial up the internet so <laughs> watching videos was like impossible you had to sit there for hours just to watch a quick clip so i actually didn't watch any like international uh matches or anything until years later when we actually got like high speed internet um but no i i have watched you know wrestling of all all around the world just because i love to learn and watch different styles and, and you know so yeah i have watched japan i have watched matches from england all over the world just not until years after i started watching wrestling oh, awesome man um i also wanted to talk to you about your um your work with the maker wish foundation how, how has that been like for you so far with uh with that organization it's been uh very very rewarding it's uh an incredible experience that you can't put a price tag on. You know, I've, I've done numerous opportunities and I'm just always very thankful to, you know, give back and just help contribute to such an amazing organization. It's been incredible and I've enjoyed every minute of it. 
how, how did you first get started uh, into it? Did you, uh, was it someone that you met that, that got you into it or? Um, I have a couple of personal experiences. So when my cousin was, I believe she was, uh, she was a teenager. I was nine years old at the time, but she was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, I'm from mm. Massachusetts. So her make a wish was to be flown to, uh, to Orlando, Florida here actually to do Disney. So my immediate family or her immediate family, I should say, were, came down here and they spent a week doing Disney and all the different parks and everything. Um, and that made a big, that really meant a lot to her and to all of us. So that was my first initial experience of knowing what make a wish, you know, was and uh, a little bit, a couple of years later, I was in uh, the seventh grade and one of my classmates uh, had a brain tumor and he, sadly he passed away about a year after that but his wish oh, man. he was a huge fan of Spongebob Squarepants so his <laughs> wish was to um, get the full on you know VIP experience so he had a, a lunch with the creator and the voice of Spongebob and they gave him like the behind the scenes like VIP experience and I remember him calling me that night to tell me about it and I can just hear the excitement in his voice. I mean, this person, this kid had went through so much, you know, so many emotionally and physically, you know, painful experiences that people can ever imagine. Yet, you know, for that one day, he was able to just have the most amazing experience that he could ever imagine. So even though he sadly passed away, it really meant a lot to him and to me and to everyone that knew him that he was able to have that thanks to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So, you know, then of course, from watching wrestling, WWE works very closely with them. They always talk about, you know, John Cena and all the work he does. So uh, it was a combination of the two personal experiences as well as hearing about it a lot through WWE that I really wanted to give back and help out. And Make-A-Wish was the, the one, first one that came to mind. Yeah, man, that that's awesome. And hearing those stories is, um, I'm very, I'm very sorry that you lost your friend at such a young age. That's um, and that's uh, sucks to hear. But um, I'm so glad that you're doing this and helping other kids, helping other kids out the best way that you can. Try to give them the best experience that they can with Make a Wish, and obviously with me, we hear that as wrestling fans, we see all the time how much work they do with trying to give them the best wish, the best day that they can. Um. So back, um, back into uh, WXW. You had a, you guys are doing a couple of shows again now. Um, how how has that been like so far doing these shows again back uh, for WXW? It's been incredible. You know the the fact that we had that little that break for a few months with the you know the pandemic. Um, I feel like the first show we had back, the fans were just they really wanted to see the action. They were like foaming at the mouth, ready to see it. So. Uh, it definitely motivated all of us to really step up our game and uh, you know show them what we've all been missing showing them why we do what we love to do so um, you know it's been uh, it's been a process but at the same time I feel like we're, we're back on the right track and WXW is continuing to grow we're getting a lot of different faces and, and new talent to really help the product out and uh, we're just doing what we do best and that's providing you know family friendly entertainment that the whole uh, whole family can enjoy. Another good thing too is uh, one complaint some people say is that some of these shows they go on for too long to the point where you know the fans kind of lose interest or you know but with WXW it's a good solid you know two hour show and it leaves you wanting more. You know, we want the fans to leave the show seeing a good solid two hour show but also making them cannot wait to come back to the next month to see the next one. So that's what we do best, in my opinion, is providing family-friendly, action-packed entertainment that leaves you wanting more each and every time. Awesome, man. That's that's fantastic to hear. Um, you got your next show coming up in a few weeks, uh, Extreme War. What what do you feel is going to be happening in that show? In that show? Um, so that one is our biggest show of the year. It's the Extreme War. It's basically a combination of if i had to give an example it's basically the royal rumble mixed with wrestlemania i say that because the main event is the 30-man battle royal 
which the winner becomes number one contender. But at the same time, the Extreme War is the, the, the granddaddy of them all for us. It's the biggest show of the year. It's our WrestleMania. So um, I will be watching the Battle Royal. I'll be there with my championship title. And just to see who's next in line, who's ready to step up to the plate and go one-on-one, toe-to-toe with one of the longest <laughs> WXW champions of all time. And as one of the longest reigning WXW champions of all time, you're obviously one of the probably the greatest WXW champions of all time. Do you feel like there? Oh, well, obviously, yeah, of course. Do you feel like there's any real challengers left for you? There's a lot of real challengers left for me. Uh, one of them is Kakoa, the Hawaiian warrior. He uh, he just joined back in WXW uh, a, few, a few shows ago. He has a lot of experience. He's actually been in the wrestling business longer than me. He's someone that oh, wow. I've never stepped in the ring with before, but he's been very impressive so far. He's he's hungry. He works hard. He travels, and he's made it very clear that he's coming for my title. So he's someone that I love to mix it up with, and uh, I think he's definitely, in my opinion, one of the leading candidates to win this whole thing. Another one is Vertigo, the Kier Rivera, someone that I've had many battles with, but someone who also claims he's coming for my title. Someone who also said he's going to win the Extreme Wars. So uh, he's another one. We got Tony Ice. He's number 30. He has the best odds of winning it all. He's actually never held the WXW Championship. Vertigo's never held it. Kakoa's never held it. Those are three men that seem to be in the lead to potentially win the whole thing and win their first WXW Championship, you know, in terms of a main event title. However, with the uh, Battle Royal, with any Battle Royal, you never know who's going to win. It could be someone that you least expect. It could be a surprise entrant. It could be someone who is making their debut. The fact is, uh, you never know what's going to happen in professional wrestling, especially in the extreme war. So the number one, number one contender, could, it could be anybody. It literally can be. So I recommend anyone and everyone who loves professional wrestling to come out April 17th, 2021 and see who is going to be the new number one contender. Man, if, if there's any way to promote a show, man, you know how to do uh, it. Um, I've done it a few times. <laughs> um, last question. Um, if for anyone who's, walk, who's listening to this, what is something uh, you wish they would... Um, what is something you want them to know as a starter, as a someone starting off in the pro wrestling uh, business, whether it is on the backstage side, whether it is in the ring side, what is something you you think they should um, come into uh, into it? I can sit here all day and answer this for hours, so I'm gonna try to simplify it as much as I can. <laughs> um, mouth shut, ears open. Again, to go back to what I said earlier, be respectful to everyone always, no matter what. Be very careful what you post on social media. There's no reason to be outspoken. I know some guys post all their dirty laundry and personal business, and they say things that could easily you know, ruin their chances of working for a major company. So um, before you post something on any social media, before you say anything in a group chat or text messaging, ask yourself, can this get me in trouble or could this prevent me from being where I want to be. So um, that's basically, you know, be respectful, but also conduct yourself like a true professional always, not just in the ring, in the locker room, outside of the ring, no matter what. On top of that, never, ever stop training. I don't care what companies you've worked for, how much experience you claim you have, how many years you've been in the business. Again, there's always stuff to learn. It's impossible to learn everything. Always train, always work hard. Treat everyone with respect. Treat everyone the way you want to be treated. Uh, Ask questions. Be a sponge. Travel. Wrestle as often as you can. Wrestle in as many different territories, states, countries, etc. as you can. Do seminars. Pick brains. Take notes. I mean, again, study matches. Find, Find your niche. Find a way to be different from everyone else. Imagine you're in a giant building with 10,000 other people and only one of you can get an opportunity what is it about you that separates you from everybody else find your niche you know make sure you stand out like for example yesterday i did a seminar tryout for uh, impact wrestling and there was 36 of us there and uh one of the coaches just wrote to me and said hey you stood out yesterday you know and i, I, and I made it a point to do that because 
you know, I, I made sure to make noise. I, I did my, you know, my facial expressions. I did my, I showed off my intensity. Because my philosophy is there's 36 of us. In my mind, I want, I want this. And we all want it. We all say we want it. But in my mind, I'm going to go out there and prove it with my actions. So think of it like that. Find your niche. Find your way to, you know, separate yourself from everybody else. Create your own path. But most importantly, you know, be safe, be healthy, uh, and be respectful to everyone. You know, don't, you don't have to do crazy things in the ring to try to get over. You know, you can get more mileage out of doing the basics done right with your own twist on it than trying to do things. Like, for example, I've seen guys do crazy flips and dives and get a, end up getting injured. You know, when in reality, they could have done a headlock with intensity, with aggression, with, with noise and got more out of that. So there's a reason you'll never see me do any crazy flips or Canadian destroyers or things like that. Nothing against that, nothing against people that do it. But I always just, you know, stick to um, doing what I feel I do best and putting my own twist on it and uh, just separating myself from everybody else. One thing that people always say is when they see me on a show, they go, you know, you stand out. You were different from everybody else. You just had something about you that made you so unique that no one else saw. And to me, that's one of the biggest compliments in the world. Wrestling is so, you know, it's so competitive. There's so many of us trying to stand out, trying to make it. But you really have to think outside the box and, and be different. But also, again, be safe, be respectful, um, and just be dependable. Ah, man, that is... um. If that is not motivational speaking right there, man, you got another you got another career in that, man. <laughs> I've done that before, actually. I do uh, anti-bullying presentations, so uh, I have a little bit of experience oh, wow. in uh, <laughs> public speaking. Yeah, that's great, man. Uh, and congratulations, getting that uh, call back from that from Impact Wrestling. I hope I hope to see you uh, on Impact Wrestling soon, man. That's great. That's great Thank to hear. You. Absolutely, I'd, I'd be honored to wrestle for. That's actually one company that I've Absolutely. never... I've done extra work before. I've done security for them. I've never actually had a match for them. Um, but that's definitely huge on my bucket list. And uh, yeah, you never know. That's great. That's awesome, man. I'll, I'll definitely keep my eye out for you, man. And if you if you do, I'll be the first one to text you and message you saying, hey, congrats. Um, thank you again for joining me today. Um, I know you can do anything else with your time right now. But I'm very uh, honored and glad you decided to hang out with me for this time. Uh, where can people find you uh, online on social media? So they can find me on Instagram and Twitter. My handle is at the, that's T-H-E, the Chico Adams. That's on Twitter and Instagram. I'm on Facebook as well. It's facebook.com slash Chico dot Adams. However, I'm approaching the 5,000 limit, so if I don't add you, it's nothing personal. Um, I'm starting to get to a point where I'm being very selective with who I add, but you're welcome to check out my profile and follow me. I also have my own YouTube channel. If you search Chico Adams, hundreds of videos should pop up. I, uh, you know, If anyone wants to watch some of my matches, my promos, you're more than welcome to do so, and I appreciate that as well. And uh, I also have my own pro wrestling tea store. I have three t-shirts currently available so uh and also my uh my dms are always open if anyone has questions or anything they want to say or ask i encourage you to do so hey you hear that everyone make sure you follow him wherever everything he just said you guys make sure you follow him everywhere right then you guys can follow me on twitter at sam 55 instagram at sam and cs5 facebook facebook.com slash sam and cs and it, to listen to this podcast, you can go to anchor.com slash talking Sam. It will be also on Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, and Google Podcasts. Thank you again to the WXW champion, Chico Adams, for joining me today. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We will see you next time. Peace and love. Bye. Thank you.